Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Dan Pybus, a director in our London transfer pricing team, specializing in financial transactions. Welcome to our episode regarding the interest rate pricing section of the OECD discussion draft on financial transactions. This forms part of a five-part series covering different aspects of the paper. I'm here today with Nick Hausman, a transfer pricing partner in our Sydney office that specializes in financial transactions. So Nick, to begin with, perhaps I could ask you, what does the discussion draft tell us about the OECD's focus areas with respect to interest rate pricing and associated loan terms? Thanks, Dan. Look, I think the first thing to say really is that discussion draft is a non-consensus document. And it seems very clear that there is some challenges that the OECD has had in trying to align the views on how this issue should be approached. The paper is the first real set of guidance on the pricing of loans that the OECD has produced in basically the history of its various documents on Article 9 and transfer pricing. And I think that absence of guidance is because of the very different views that countries are bringing to the table in terms of how this issue should be approached. One of the issues is a thin capitalisation issue and capital structure, which will be dealt with in another session in more detail. But it's important to know that local laws and different countries have brought in their own uh, jurisdictional approaches to interest rate pricing and, and practices over the years. And so that, I think, also muddies the water in terms of how countries are approaching, the, you know, trying to achieve a consensus view on pricing of loans. Probably what comes out strongly from this paper and is important for people to to realise is that it's not just about pricing of loans. The OECD is really approaching this as a two-step approach in terms of firstly looking at uh, whether the terms and conditions of the loan itself is arm's length and then only once that has been determined approaching the pricing question. So it's essentially adopting the delineation of the transaction approach that released in, in the earlier guidance. The paper does put on the table, though, some of the big issues that have been debated internationally by a number of countries in terms of how interest rate pricing should be approached. Issues such as the implicit support, the recognition of the dealings or non-recognition, use of credit ratings, the value of internal comparables versus external comparables. Those are the sorts of things that are all now out there in the open and there's commentary on. So that's helpful and that's going to be useful to get some insights into the way in which the OECD is is, is looking at this issue. But one of the big challenges, obviously, is that the OECD is, it appears to be trying to get the right answer to this issue. And yet I think one of the, the sort of precursors to that is making sure that all countries are agreed on what the question is that this paper is trying to address. So you've given an overview there, Nick, of the key areas this paper is looking at from an interest rate pricing point of view. But what are the BEPS risks that the OECD are hoping to address through the discussion draft? Dan, that's a difficult question to answer because I guess the simple immediate answer is that at its heart, what the OECD is trying to address is excessive amounts of deductible debt being claimed to profit shift out of, out of country. So that's in its very sort of simplest terms. However, because this paper has come right at the very end of the BEPS process, it's important to remember that we've already had a number of actions that have been introduced and are working their way through the system that do address that same issue. So the paper on thin capitalization, anti-hybrids, some of the issues that or the concerns or risks that this paper is trying to address would arguably be mitigated through some of those other actions. So it does raise the question as to what extent this paper is perhaps over-engineered the approach and is trying to work, use transfer pricing in Article 9 to do perhaps more things than is is necessary to deal with the underlying risk the BEPS project is trying to address. Okay, so let's focus then on some of the areas the OCD does cover in the paper. So they mention loan terms and this raises some interesting points. To what extent do terms discussed by the OECD actually influence pricing decisions at arm's length? Yes, Dan, that's probably going to be one of the areas that will be important for taxpayers to focus on. What the OECD is essentially saying is that the terms of the related party loan need to be arm's length, and that needs to be considered in the context of a range of matters, including the functions, assets and risks, options realistically available and the business strategies of the taxpayer. Now, we would all agree that a independent loan with a, an unrelated party, the loan agreement itself could be a very lengthy document ranging to hundreds of pages. And a typical related party loan will not have that same degree of depth 
a number of clauses. But the key issue here that the OECD is focused on is terms within a loan agreement that may have an impact upon the ultimate price that is agreed and whether those terms can be sustained and supported at arm's length. That does create, though, a difficulty for taxpayers because if we take an example that gets raised in the paper, which is covenants, there is a question that gets raised as to what to do where a related party loan does not have a covenant. Now, at arm's length, certain loans would have covenants, particularly with banks, but there are also instruments out there on the market that do not have covenants and they may have a different price attached because they're in a different market. So there does need to be then a consideration given where a related party has a loan that does not have a covenant. Is that in itself non-arm's length requiring a covenant to be imputed and a price to be determined based upon that assumption? Or is the lack of a covenant something that is just a reflection of the fact that the parties are related and the parent has a better understanding of the capacity to pay of its subsidiary? So those sorts of issues, I think, are going to be very challenging for taxpayers to work through because it does require a couple of things to be considered. One being whether or not a covenant is appropriate in the first place And secondly, what is the impact of that covenant, if any, on the price of a loan? That form of analysis needs to be undertaken, though, for all of the terms that may have a significant impact upon the price of that loan. And that that could include things such as tenor, the currency, and a range of other matters that may have an impact upon the price that the loan would be struck at an arm's length basis. Okay. And just building on this theme, then, I know that one of the key focus areas for the Australian tax authorities has been the implication and application of the Chevron case more broadly. To what extent do you think the Chevron case has influenced the OECD's perspective with regard to pricing? I think there is certainly a strong flavour of elements of the Chevron decision in this paper. And to put that in context, the Chevron decision essentially involved a fairly simple set of facts whereby a US subsidiary in the chain raised from the third-party money markets under guarantee from the ultimate parent and provided those funds to an Australian company on, under terms that were long-term in a different currency and were unguaranteed or unsecured. Now, the interesting part of the Chevron decision for many people was the approach the court to the key issue in the debate. So the key issue was whether or not the loan itself to the Australian company should be priced based upon the terms and conditions of the related party loan as struck or whether there were elements of the loan itself which were non-arm's length and should be adjusted. The court took the view that the loan to the Australian taxpayer would not have taken place under those terms had it been at arm's length. And in particular, the element that the court took a view on was the security. The view was that the loan to the Australian company would have been guaranteed by the parent if they had been dealing at arm's length. And as such, the price for that loan should reflect the value of that guarantee. And the logic behind that approach from the court was that there was evidence within the group that the Chevron group sought to raise funds externally at the lowest possible cost. So that influenced the court's thinking to the view that the related party loan should reflect terms and conditions that sought to achieve the lowest possible cost of funding for the Australian taxpayer. Importantly, elements of the related party loan were left intact where they had clearer evidence that they reflected the actual conditions. So, for example, the longer term nature of the loan to the Australian taxpayer was respected on the basis that it was a longer term investment that was being made in in the Australian oil and gas sector. So clearly those sorts of flavours are coming through in the OECD's approach, which is to look at the, from the perspective of the borrower, what its business strategies are and asking the question as to what are the terms and conditions that would be expected to be in place with that borrower under those circumstances. I think that is going to be a very difficult exercise to undertake for a lot of taxpayers and it does raise the question as to exactly how that analysis should be undertaken in the framework. That's something that is probably not clear yet within the OECD paper itself. Okay, so there's a fair bit to think about then from a practical perspective, but what what areas do we consider to be the most burdensome from a client's point of view? So I think one of the big challenges for clients is going to be 
that as this is a non-consensus document, what to make of that. It does fill a vacuum of guidance from the OECD, but as I said earlier, local countries have their own rules and regulations in place, so those are going to take precedent. But this paper is obviously going to have an influence on the way tax authorities think about and approach pricing of loans. Secondly, there are some real practical challenges for taxpayers if this paper does get finalised as a consensus document. And one of those challenges is that the level of analysis that needs to be undertaken to price a loan is significantly greater than it was perhaps five years ago. That does raise practical compliance issues. And at the moment, this paper doesn't distinguish between small related party loans and billion dollar related party loans. So there is no indication that the level of work that's required is different under either of those scenarios. Okay, so just building on that last point in terms of the materiality of the loan transaction, what are the options for clients in terms of managing the potential workload? So this is not addressed in the paper, Dan, but I think it's going to be something that I would suggest would be helpful for the OECD to make some sort of recommendation in relation to. At the moment, a number of countries have introduced their own low compliance options for dealing with related party loans. For example, in Australia, there is a lower level of compliance expected for taxpayers that have loans, inbound loans of less than 50 million Australian dollars. Other countries have got similar approaches as well, including the use of safe harbours. I think there is some benefit in the OECD providing some guidance in this area so that there is some consistency in approach, at least in terms of the parameters, because I think it's going to be a real challenge, not just for taxpayers, but for tax authorities themselves, to be able to fly some of the principles in this paper. And so some form of concessionary approach to lower level loans, I think, would be helpful. Absent that, I think clients are going to need to think about this perhaps from a central perspective and try and look at themes that are running across their portfolio of loans that are happening within the group and perhaps group issues together and consider them at a central perspective. But I think the real issue here is going to be what local tax authorities in their jurisdictions do and how they approach this issue because it's going to be a very different experience, I suspect, in countries that have perhaps you know, lesser levels of experience of, of dealing with related party loans and which are going to require some real skilling up in order to consider and apply these, these rules. Okay, so there's plenty to think about and it sounds like there's also plenty of uncertainty still anticipated in the meantime. So recommendations wise, what would be your top three recommendations for clients when they're reflecting on the paper? Well, I think, Dan, the first thing is don't panic. This paper is a, it's a discussion draft, a non-consensus discussion draft. And while it is the first piece of guidance the OECD has released, at the moment there are a lot of areas that still need further work. But what clients and taxpayers should be looking to do, I think, first and foremost, is just make sure they've got the basics covered. Are there loan agreements in place for all of the loans that are in the group? Are those loan agreements current? Have they been followed in practice? You'd be surprised a number of loans where there has been a loan agreement put in place that has a particular set of terms. At the expiry of that loan, it's just rolled forward and the pricing hasn't been considered or the terms haven't changed. Has the transfer pricing been considered and is there documentation in place for loans? So those are all the basics that need to be covered. The second thing that I'd be suggesting taxpayers do is consider their current model for pricing loans and providing loans around the group against some of the key issues that are being raised. Issues such as substance, where are the functions being undertaken? Where are the treasury functions being undertaken? Are they central? Are they decentralised? Are they being treated as a service activity or as a, as a central profit pool? What's the positions being taken on implicit support? What's the impact of external group policies? Does the group have an external policy of guaranteeing loans or providing security over loans? What are the terms of the loans that are being applied within the group? Are there guarantee fees? Are they being charged or not? And is cash pooling an issue and being used? And I'd look at all of those issues. I'd compare them against what the OECD is saying and start to build a bit of gap analysis in terms of what the, the key areas are where the taxpayer may have different positions or consistent positions with what the OECD is suggesting. And then thirdly, I would certainly, before acting, make sure that local rules, local regulatory rules, local tax rules, interpretations and practices are considered, particularly in the major jurisdictions in which loans and, uh, are being provided. There are many overlapping issues that this paper will, will raise, so things such as you know, thin capitalisation, 
withholding tax implications, issues with anti-hybrids and how anti-hybrid issues may be resolved. It's important to ensure a holistic approach is taken to dealing with all of the cross-border related party transaction issues and that transfer pricing issues are not addressed purely in isolation. Okay, thank you, Nick. I've got one final question for you, and I'm going to ask you to speculate a little bit here. In terms of the longer term direction of travel from the OECD, which areas do you think will remain in the final consensus version of the paper? So, Dan, I think the OECD has got an unenviable task here because there is such a divergence of views on some of the issues that this paper raises. So trying to get consensus is going to be very difficult because of the extent to which each country has adopted its own rules its own practices and around um, some of the issues that are being raised. Unscrambling, that's going to be a real challenge. But there are probably some areas in here that I think will remain and which are reflective of the approach that is probably common across a lot of countries. Areas such as the approach towards internal comparables and external comparables. There are some helpful comments from the OECD about adjustments that can be made for certain things, quantitative adjustments to comparables. That I expect will, will remain. There's some helpful commentary around credit rating analysis and the value of an external credit rating, I expect that will be remaining, maybe not in exactly the same form, but there will be some reference to credit rating analysis, which I think is helpful because that is one of the central issues that taxpayers do find challenging. Some of the areas that I think are going to be open for debate include around this delineation of the transaction approach and exactly how far that needs to go. Issues around capital structure, I think, raise really important questions around whether Article 9 is the right place to be addressing that or whether that requires some other measures. But I think one of the really strong themes that's come through from this paper, and I think that will remain, is that the pricing of a related party loan is going to require a much broader understanding of the context of that loan than perhaps has been the approach that taxpayers have taken. It's not just a matter of taking the loan agreement, a balance sheet of the borrower, and then coming up with a price. It will require a much broader understanding of the Treasury functions, the role of Treasury, what it's done, how the group is approaching its external financing obligations, what the business strategies are, industry-specific factors, and other factors that are going to be relevant to the context of and purpose of behind the transaction. Those are the sorts of things that I think it's inevitable tax authorities are going to want to look at in a more holistic way and that's something that I think taxpayers are going to have to take on board and address and deal with in their approach to the transfer pricing of loans. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Nick. And thank you all for your time today. Please look out for the other episodes in this five-part series, which will cover guarantees, captives, cash pooling, and also delineation.